you enjoy our videos, subscribe and make sure you click the bell so you're notified of our latest content. Hello, this is Alec Gillis. Today we're going to talk to you about the practical effects of Starship Troopers. We started work on Starship Troopers, uh, I don't know, when was that movie released? About uh, a year before the movie was released. After uh, about, I don't know, six months of meetings before we were even on payroll, um, we finally got to go ahead. One of the first projects we started on was the giant larva. This was cut from the film ultimately, but it was a beautiful sculpture that Kent Jones uh, sculpted for us. And there he is in the giant empty warehouse which we rented in Canoga Park. Uh, we were working simultaneously on Alien Resurrection and we just needed extra space. So we uh, rented uh, some space uh, right next to, I believe, where they shot uh, pornographic movies. Uh, so it was very interesting when the food truck would arrive and the crew of the pornographic uh, uh, motion picture company would go to the uh, same truck as my uh, monster making um, fellows, nerds. Uh, that's what we call them, nerds. Uh, anyway, so there's the, uh, there, there is the, the larva coming together. Uh, it was going to be a big puppet. We we're going to make a bunch of them. And they're essentially going to be suits that people wore, but the, the, uh, the scene was scrapped due to cost. Here's the wonderful Norman Cabrera sculpting on the sand beetle. You can see in the background are my sketches um, of the design of the sand beetle. And it's one of the few uh, creatures that we actually designed. Most of the designs came to us from Phil Tippett's studio. There's Steve Koch, longtime artist and contributor uh, of ADI, and he was one of the major sculptors on the parts and pieces you see. We only sculpted two legs because they were kind of bilaterally symmetrical and only two different leg designs. Uh, Yuri Everson came in and saved the day with the eyes. The, those They started off as giant eyes and then ended up as being tiny ones, and that pleased Paul Verhoeven, and Yuri was a hero. There's me and Dan Brodzik talking about different color schemes. Um, and here's two different color schemes we presented to Paul and got his notes, and, uh, and then we set off about uh, doing tests of sawing them open. You can see what happens when you use a circular sawing wheel. All of the slime beads up in a comical fashion. So we decided that that would not be the way to go. Uh, this is all silicone interior guts and stuff, all cast up, stuff that we've used repeatedly before and since. I think a lot of these guts were also used in Alien Resurrection for the time. Looks pretty real, doesn't it? This was a uh, Mach 2 version. Now you'll see it's a reciprocating uh, saw, an actual medical saw, and that works much better. We had bladders inside under the guts and the slime so that it would crack open like it was uh, the internals were all under pressure, and then you could scoop around and pull things out and have a, have a blast. And this was what... Um, Casper uh, Van Dien got to do on screen in that famous scene where, uh, I don't know, doesn't somebody throw up in it um, uh, in the movie? But anyway, there's lots of stuff, goo being pumped. And when you do tests like this, you realize uh, how to do it uh, correctly. So it's important to test. There's Casper, and uh, he's, he's busting it open right there and enthusiastically digging through the guts. And I think she's about to throw. Yeah, look at her getting sick. She's going to throw up, I think. She's getting ready. I don't know if she'll actually do it in this take or not. But anyway, Casper had a great time with this stuff, pulling it out. He's really, he's so enthusiastic. He loves practical effects, and it's always fantastic working with him. You can see the bladder there is that big um, inflated part, and that helped us to, um, to uh, allow the guts to squeeze out like a, a crack and open a roll of Pillsbury dough. There's the tanker bug, the back uh, of that. We carved that out of green foam, um, built over a shell. Uh, we sliced up Phil Tippett's um, uh, little maquette and uh, came up with the bulkhead approach, you know, for it. Um, Bob Clark, um, who is an excellent um, sculptor and has done big things and small things. Bob Clark sculpted the dog from Cujo, by the way. That's where I first met him. Um, and uh, so there it is taking shape, and uh, ultimately it became a big, gigantic mold. Uh, there's Brent Armstrong helping out. I'm not sure who the other guy is. Looks like, no? I don't know who that other guy is. Uh, Bob Clark is the one up on the top there uh, sculpting away. 
And uh, ultimately, we, as I mentioned, we made a big, gigantic fiberglass mold, and into that fiberglass, multi-piece fiberglass mold, we cast up fiberglass positives of the shell. And that whole shell then got mounted on a, uh, a tractor that John Richardson and his crew found. There's Bob Clark painting the giant shell of the, uh, of the tanker bug. And uh, people ask us where these things are, and we say, well, they were just too big to keep. Uh, there's Paul Verhoeven directing... Um, this is probably either a test or its second unit. Uh, there's the tanker bug, the hole that goes into the tanker bug's back. Uh, there it is. You kind of start to see the uh, the rig underneath it, which is this really high-tech, uh, cool-looking tractor. It had a really neat tread pattern to it, but it was very it was articulated so it could raise up and down and wobble side to side. And uh, we just made the cladding. Look at those treads, aren't those badass? We just made the cladding of the shell and John Richardson's crew. Um, stuck it on the back of that tractor but it could carry the weight of uh you know the whole camera crew so and those guys aren't thin uh that's marked out right there where the where the hole was where uh casper shot it with his uh machine gun and threw hand grenades into it um and uh yeah look at that background too there's casper he's a hero in every sense. Look at that background. I, I just love this. It's uh, Wyoming, I think it is. Or is it South Dakota? I don't know. Now we're back in the workshop, uh, and you can see it's starting to get a little more busy and filled, and the brain bug is being sculpted. Once again, Bob Clark, master sculptor, uh, is sculpting on the giant brain bug. This, again, designed by Craig Hayes of Phil Tippett's uh, crew, and uh, it was a very interesting design, very non-anthropomorphic, and at one point, Paul Verhoeven got very worried that it was so non-anthropomorphic, he said, it looks like the front of a Boeing. I'm not sure how we're going to get the motion out of this, and we just kind of convinced him we'll do it. We know the tricks of puppeteering, and we'll be able to make it look like it's uh, frightened or uh, threatening either way. There's Steve Koch again. He's sculpting the face area. That face area was sculpted in wed clay, which is why it's wrapped in plastic to keep it from drying out. And then uh, we molded that and cast it up out of urethane. Um, and it's got a, a little sort of uh, interesting mouth there that I don't know may may bring uh, to mind thoughts of certain anatomical parts. But anyway, um, there is the uh, a nearly finished um, uh, bug. What we ended up doing was um, sculpting it out of, uh, carving it out of the green foam there, as you see. And then uh, we painted it with house paint. And then we added more texture on top of that with clay. We added bumps and some veins and things like that. And then there was a, there was a point uh, later on after... Um, after the, the the character was finished, that uh, Phil Tippett introduced veins into the into the uh, the bug uh, the, the brain bug, and we had to create some appliance veins to stick on them to to keep it matched. But there it is. Look at all those nice bumps and bulges and all that. Uh, a lot of sculptors working on that one, but mainly Bob Clark and Steve Koch. Um, there's Andy Schoenberg doing some injection, foam injection. I, is that Mitch Coughlin with the shaved head? Maybe. Um, and, uh-oh, more people I don't recognize. Um, there it is. One piece of it fits into our gigantic mold, so we had to do it in parts and pieces. There's Tim Leach in the gorgeous pink, uh, or salmon, I guess, shorts. Um, so all these separate pieces, uh, f four maybe foam latex skins, had to be stitched together. They were fabric back, uh, and, they, and they were stitched together. This is the crane that the, uh, the whole system sat on. Uh, it was big enough that it allowed us to fit five puppeteers into the, into the character, uh, and each one was doing a different um, operation. KC, why can't I remember his name? He was a good painter. Um, there's Dan Brodsick and G, G. I'll remember her name at some point after this is all over with. Um, and uh, so, you know, it had a, it was a combination of mechanical parts and hand puppeted parts, like the the mouth area, that vertical mouth. I don't know what you would call that. I don't know what, what uh, other than to call it a vertical mouth, but that was hand puppeted. So, um, you know, you could get your hand in there, work it in a very uh, organic way. Uh, the eyes were on... Um, we're on kind of rod shafts, you know, that you can make it look around and look scared and so on. Oh, the chin, you can see the compression in the chin. That was because we filled it with uh, beach balls down there. So it was kind of, in, we found that beach balls were a nice way to um, create compression uh, out of the foam latex skin. But it was really uh, quite, a, quite a nice little character. There I am uh, running through the, uh, um, the, 
choreography with the puppeteers. Um, and uh, I'm sure you'll see Yuri Everson here at some point. Yuri was uh, big uh, on Starship Troopers, uh, not only in running the, the shop, but also in uh, working with puppeteers and managing the, uh, uh, the, the moving of these gigantic creatures. Each one of them would take a half day to get into position. So there it is, all rolling, all moving together, um, and there we are testing it. This would be in Los Angeles now for the indoor scenes, and we're t targeting, and you know, you have to line that stinger up, that proboscis up uh, to something, so it may as well be a foam head as opposed to a real person. But this did give us an idea of what a real person kneeling in front of it would, would look like. Um, those big feeder claws that you see are uh, the bases of them were operated by hand, but they were uh, cable operated or servo. I think maybe cable operated. There's some servo stuff in the in the uh, fingertips, I believe, of those puppet, those uh, other paddles. I think the paddles maybe had, oh, there it is, ouch. The paddle uh, hands had, uh, they, uh, okay, sorry. There's, uh, there goes Yuri, was that him? I don't know. Shannon Shea, my old buddy Shannon Shea from the Stan Winston days was inside making the proboscis come in and out. Uh, and there was lots of slime dripping on the inside of that thing as well. Um, and I used to run around in the back and uh, shout instructions to them and also make fun of them because they were all inside a giant slippery bug head. And that's what you do when your friends are doing that, you make fun of them. Um, we added some bladders up in the forehead area too at some point. Uh, sorry, not bladders. Uh, it was like a rolling rig, kind of like cro croissant shapes that were moving up on a conveyor belt to create this um, pulsating head. Because that was another thing Phil Tippett came up with uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, this, this look of undulation that we then had to match. Um, that was Yuri putting some blood on the, on the tip of the, uh, the proboscis. Looks like he's just sucked somebody's head dry. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, so a lot of our uh, uh, approach to making the character look, um, look angry and imperious was that he would rise up on that big crane that you saw and look down on you. And we discovered that that was a pretty cool looking um, and scary looking intimidating um, uh, angle, but then when his brain was being read and and um, and and you know he's afraid uh, when um, uh, Neil Patrick Harris says he's afraid, then he was a puppy dog. His chin was low to the ground. He was looking up and quivering, and that's how we got that going. There's the framework, the bulkhead for the warrior bug. Once again, what we did was we took Phil Tippett's maquettes, resin maquettes, and sliced them up at even intervals, and then did uh, uh, outline drawings of those, and then recreated them in, in uh, bulkhead form. And then we sculpted them. Um, and uh, those were all oil clay. That was not uh, wet clay because that was a little too complex. It would dry out too quickly. So there's Linda Frobos. Uh, I see George Bernoda in there. Uh, there's Yuri Everson with his hands behind his back. Uh, Mitch Coughlin helping sculpt there. And another, let's see. Oh, is that uh, Jose Fernandez? Wait. No, that's uh, Hirsch Fernand Fernandez. Yeah, that's right. And... Um, Mm, I've completely forgotten the name of the sculptor, that woman right there. Darn it, that's bad. How do I do this? Oh well. Uh, she was a very talented sculptor, but I don't, I don't know that she stayed in the industry. I'm not sure. There's Brent Armstrong right there, and uh, you saw Steve Koch again. And uh, they were all it was a very talented bunch of sculptors on that crew. And then the, uh, uh, the next step after uh, sculpture was mold making. And they were big fiberglass molds with sections that might have been uh, in silicone just because of the undercuts and so on. But some fairly complex mold making. There's one of the upper jaw pieces, the beak that uh, Brent is working on. There's a Tremors standee. I wonder what happened to that. We don't have that anymore, I don't think. Uh, this is at our old studio in uh, Canoga Park. And we, um, we outgrew it. So we had to move to that other uh, big um, that other big uh, uh, warehouse space. There she is again. Darn it, I feel bad. I'm going to have to like throw up a graphic, find out who she was. Um, Steve Koch, again, he's everywhere. Uh, that looks like 
Uh, that looks like Hirsch's hair. There he is. Look at that. So he was a Hirsch worked for us a lot. His brother is Jose Fernandez, who is um, they're both uh, excellent, both great guys. And Jose, you'll know him from Ironhead, and he has done a lot of different uh, sculptures for uh, superhero costumes and things since Starship Troopers. There's all the bug parts, uh, and they were designed cleverly. They were bilaterally symmetrical, so you could just sculpt one leg and use them for use the molds for all four. And uh, you know, you'd never know it. It was good for the computer, and it was good for us too. It saved a little bit of resources for us. Um, we did have to do things like the size of the ball for the practical one. We increased the size of the ball because we needed more mechanical leverage. Uh, in the computer, you don't need mechanical leverage because you're not lifting any weight, actually. But we had to make it as if it was a real thing. So we would change some of the proportions. And Phil Tippett was great with that because he has, you know, grow, grew up in practical effects. So he he knew the world very well. He'd just say, sure, change it to make it work. No one's ever going to notice the difference. And uh, we always appreciated that about Phil. He's a very practical thinker and uh, and a wise person. Um, I, I we just really seem to be interested in the joints there in this in that cinematography, the out of focus source. There we are painting everything. Steve Biscano there. I see Norman Cabrera. Another uh, wait, who is that? Hmm, another guy lost in the mist of time, uh, or my just my bad memory. Sorry. Uh, so yes, lots of painting, and it was a combination of acrylic paints and automotive paints. So you know we would we would do an automotive um, black. Uh, we would ca cast them up in black. Uh, intrinsically, and then we would primer them and we'd do more black. But it, uh, eventually, all the layers of paint were sealed with um, with automotive sealer to protect them. So they were basically like car bodies, although plastic car bodies. Um, and uh, the final step in painting was to do a rub out, we call it, of a, a dust color. So it's sort of a beigey dust color that we made sure that we matched. We brought some of the dirt home from the location and matched the color to that so that it would look like they were dusty and from the uh, there look at that lineup it looks like a the world's greatest yard sale doesn't it so there they are before they got their finishing touches of uh, of the dusty coat and um, you know sometimes I guess we uh, would ha have to weld them after we put them together um, but they did have welded steel armatures in them so that you could pose them or that you could use the legs as floppy legs uh, for follow along movement when we did our uh, big hydraulic version I think we did about 13 or 15 dead bugs, um, maybe five of which were burned. Um, and to create the burned look, we took a black expanding, two-part expanding uh, rigid foam. It might have been soft foam. I think it was rigid foam. And uh, mixed that up and brushed it right onto the, uh, uh, right onto the bug. And uh, it would foam up, and then you'd have this black, bubbly black system. There's Steve Rosenbluth working on our... Uh, in our, our proprietary uh, in-house motion control system. That motion control system, uh, which Steve was uh, breaking a lot of ground with, we, we wanted our own system because we wanted uh, to have a nice ergonomic uh, way of programming, editing, and performing the puppets because they were quite complex. And they could kill you if they got out of control. Um, and there you have some of the interior workings. Phil Nataro there was one of the main guys involved in that, along with George Bernoda. Um, and, um, yeah, it was a lot of work. Khan Ikeuchi is down there on his knees, Steve Rosenbluth in the beautiful fuchsia uh, sweater um, from the 90s. And uh, uh, you see the complexity of it. They, they were really uh, beautifully crafted. There's Luke Conley, and I'll give him some credit there. Luke Conley was big into the mechanics of this thing too but you can see that you know when you have to start moving long spindly limbs around like that you have to put some effort into uh how you're gonna keep them from bouncing so we had a lot of like feedback um uh stuff going on where the you know sensors would tell you how fast and how far it's moving and then you'd have uh, other little motors that would push back against that to try to keep down what we call the wugga wugga uh there we are uh testing the rig to toss a stuntman around in um this stuntman and uh, hey i'm blanking on his name what a surprise he went on to direct look at his pants are coming down <laughs> um he went on to direct action movies and uh um he's quite a nice guy quite game he said that during these tests he threw up in his mouth and swallowed it 
so that he wouldn't look like a wuss. And that's when you know you're a real stuntman. Me, I would have just screamed, I would have spewed all over everyone, and the test would have been over. Um, so, luckily, he was the stuntman. There's the big rig. It's the same crane that we put the brain bug on. Um, we built it for this. We built it in sections so it could be assembled. And then we mounted our uh, hydraulic uh, character to the end of that. Um, there we are looking with Paul Verhoeven, looking at the uh, one of the dead bucks, talking talking about how it works and how it's coming together. And Paul was a very um, he's a very sharp-minded guy. He's he's got an engineer's mind, and uh, so he likes to know a lot about things. Um, and uh, he's he's a character. There's Yost Vacano right over Paul's shoulder. He's the DP, and um, Vic Armstrong. Uh, next to him there wearing the glasses. Vic Armstrong is a legendary stuntman and uh, second unit director. He's just done tons of stuff, Bond movies and all this. And the second unit on this movie was as big as, you know, two normal movies. Uh, so you can see that the, the bug is not finished painting. This particular one is not finished painting yet. We've got just got the blacks and reds and yellows laid in. Um, there's Vic Armstrong giving his stuntman a little bit of a rest. So, uh, oh, so this, that said reverse, didn't it? So we're, I don't know why we're trying reverse action on this, just to see. But look at, so you see how there's kind of, oh yeah, that's why. Because you can't really hit a mark very well. But if you do it in reverse, you can start the claw on its target and then pull it away from it. And then you do it in reverse and it looks like it's, uh, you know, it looks like it's hitting its mark. Um, this might have been the throw up day. Because I think when Paul was there, he was really asking for him to thrash the guy around. You can see some bending in the uh, upper uh, beak. That's because that's a soft section there. I think we ended up, uh, it, it was soft because that's the part that uh, had to chomp down on him. He's wearing a harness. Uh, you see the strapping, but he's also wearing a fiberglass body harness, body plate that bolts into the lower jaw. So he's really not uh, resting on that knife edge. That would be uh, very, very painful. But look at him. He's doing great, man. And, um, and then the upper beak, as I said, was rubber, so we could, like, you know, bite down on him a little bit. Um, hmm. Yost Vacano. Yes. Oh, now we've switched positions. We had two body plates. That's right. You can see the body plate there. That would normally go under his costume, and it did in the film. So that, uh, you know, so his costumes had to make uh, special um, pants so that you could, like, have the plate already dressed in the pants, and then the actor gets in them, and you close the, the pants down or around them. Um, and the legs, you'll notice, are follow-along. So that was a reverse shot, right? So you didn't know that until just the very end. Reverse shots usually suck right at the end, so you have to cut before they get sucky. There's a bunch of the parts and pieces of shot up, bugs, dead bugs. Um, and, uh, you know, we just, there's some, some of the burned stuff we did. That's the uh, technique I was telling you about earlier with the polyfoam. Um, and... Uh, Boy, I'm not going to try to list every crew member because I'll just embarrass myself. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure what the torch is. I guess maybe we actually created some burn uh, marks with torches. That seems inefficient to me. But it actually looked good, so what the hell do I know? Um, yeah, lots and lots of them, man. Um, though that uh, yellow... Uh, that yellow... Uh, Station Wagon was from the movie Michael, I believe. We were doing a bunch of things at the same time. Michael was another movie with John Travolta's wings, and we had to do a test where we drove the wings around. Anyway, that's a different video. There's Yuri Everson. Look at how nice and burned that looks, doesn't it? That's just an excellent technique. <laughs> we're so awesome. I think we dry brushed some uh, gray over top of it, painted like, you know, you see the green, the old green stains and stuff. Uh, where the blood has run from it. But, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good bug because it's a dead bug. Oh, here we are at uh, the uh, the base. What is it? Whiskey Tango Fox? No, uh, Whiskey Camp? I don't remember. Um, anyway, the fort, right, where the big attack was. Uh, so this was a beautiful set, and uh, all of the pieces were uh, trucked in and, 
and it was all assembled in the middle of freaking nowhere. And then we trucked in our, uh, you know, hand carried trucked and then hand carried in our uh, bugs. There's some of Kevin Yeager's work. Kevin Yeager did all the dead bodies and the gore effects. He did some beautiful fake heads, people getting shot and brains sucked out, and it was really good work on his, on his part. It was nice uh, working with my old pal Kevin on that and getting to go to a location in the middle of nowhere, and um, you know. Working for Paul Verhoeven, you always have good stories when you work for Paul Verhoeven. Um, yeah, so it was a it was a big effort. I'm sure these guys were probably building this fort for months before we even got out there. But I love the touches, like all the the shot the you know the shot up walls and stuff. Really neat. And uh, they say if you don't like the weather in Wyoming, uh, wait 15 minutes. So you can see that it's constantly changing weather. It's getting cold. It's getting warm. It's, you know, look at the beautiful slime. Look at all that reticulated stuff. I'm not sure if we did this on purpose or not. Um, you, you can do that with oils and, and water-based stuff. Um, Yuri Everson was uh, big in, uh, in all this process of managing crews to, you know, dress these things out and make them look cool. He was kind of... We were all off on different units. Um, you know, there was second unit, and then you had to prep for another day. And, um, yeah, tons and tons of work. Tons and tons of weight of of uh, bugs, too. These things were heavy. You try to make them lightweight, but they also have to be durable. Very dramatic. Very dramatic indeed. And we planned these all out. We had... Uh, we took Phil Tippett's maquettes and we posed them in different poses and took pictures of them, submitted them to Paul Verhoeven, and he picked the ones he wanted. And then uh, we built them. And you could kind of mix and match them a little bit. You could pull the legs off one and stick them on another just to create some variation and differences. You know, you get 15 dead bugs and all the co possible combinations are pretty, pretty endless. Oh, there's a really unfortunate fellow there who got snipped in half. <clears throat> um, yeah, look at it all. Isn't it gorgeous? Right now would be a good time for me to remember the names of those people. And I could fill these gaps while you look at all these spectacular behind-the-scenes photos. But not going to happen. Uh, let's see. Oh, real 50 caliber machine guns up on the, uh, the parapets there, if that's what you call them. Um, and these guys would start shooting just with blanks. And you could feel the reverberation in your chest from like... A hundred yards away. Dizzy Flores. She got stabbed, didn't she? Um, and uh, in slow motion by a really cool Phil Tippett creature. The, the work in that, in the movie, I think, is still exemplary. Still some of the best combo of digital and practical work that's ever been done. There are the different plugs for the back of the tanker bug. Um, and uh, this is kind of how we got around. You need to set up a bug. You got to throw it on a on a mule and drive it, you know, half a mile away. Um, yeah, it was quite an endeavor. But it was fun, you know. What else were we doing? Nothing. Yeah, look at that. And and, and I think, I feel like this might have been some private land where the big explosion was done, which is why we could paint the ground like that and why we could actually set off gigantic fireball explosions. Um, maybe. Anyway. This might have been in uh, South Dakota, this stuff. Um, yeah, just gorgeous. Just gorgeous. It really looks like a different planet. Mm-hmm. Well, let's see. Dirt. What else should I say? Uh, huge. Oh, how about, the, how about those, those roughnecks? When you got all those... Uh, actors in their costumes and they're geared up and they were running it was really intimidating i remember walking down a trail and they all went jogging past me like real soldiers and they're all their equipment's rattling and um and just the heavy footfalls it was really it was very impressive and they were hot out there man having to wear all that that gear look at them all and they all went through boot camp together and uh yeah casper was uh was the most enthusiastic of, of all of them. He, he's just a great guy. If you get a chance to do creature effects on a Casper Van Dien movie, take it. Take that chance. There's Yuri slapping slime. Yuri is actually a master of, uh, of slime. He's an, he's an artist. Uh, that's why I call him Vincent Van Gogh. 
Oh, look at the explosion. Finally. Okay. Here we go. Now here's something to talk about. Uh, yeah, that was the big cave explosion, which was mostly dust and stuff. But, man, you've never seen an explosion like this in real life. It was just freaking scary. Uh, lots of gasoline. That's what creates all the big, uh, the big uh, fiery the fireballs. There's a guy who's an amputee, and uh, he was good enough to let us. He was a rollerblader, as I recall. Um, and look at that. What a great effect that is, huh? So we had to do a, 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 a gag here where the bug bites his leg off. And, you know, when you undercrank that by a few frames, it's pretty effective. Kevin Yeager made him a stump and a fake leg, and uh, the rest is history. So these are nice little moments, nice uses of practical effects where you pop in and uh, you get a, a, a little real moment of a creature actually interacting with a human being. Um, it's, it's pretty impressive. That gray box over there is the pump, and we were kind of putting the creature through its movement just to see. You have to see where the problem areas are. Like if you do a, a quick, ro uh, you know, um, jaggedy movement back and forth, uh, high-frequency movement, you get all the shake uh, that you that you're you know you're wondering where the shake is and that exposes it and then you either know how not to move it or you make adjustments mechanical or electronic adjustments to smooth it out. But one of the tricks that that we've done is to um, is to operate the creature slowly and then uh, undercrank. So which basically means you shoot it in fast motion, but you have greater control. So you can get the creature to move quickly while. Um, uh, while keeping the, the movement smooth by simply slowing down the movement. This uh, was setting up for the follow-up after he gets his leg snipped and then the creature picks him up, thrashes him around. There's Dave Pinnacus. Oh, I didn't mention Dave Pinnacus. He's been our mechanical designer for lo these many years, and uh, he goes back a long time with us. Uh, and there he was with his ass in the ground, as sometimes we we're asked to do. Um, yeah. Steve Frakes is back there. I think that's him with the hat on somewhere, if that's not him. He's, he's pulling a wire that kind of controls one of the joints of the, of the leg. This is kind of our, our drive in when we would go to base camp and then we would be shuttled down in one of these little four wheel drive vehicles. And this is what we looked at every day on the way down. The beauty of Wyoming. Is that the fort? Yep, there it is. Look how far away it is, man. They did a great job on that. It was just so cool to, to just you know come over the crest of the hill and see a sci-fi fort in the middle of a, the Badlands. Oh, they put up some street signs too. Can't remember what the streets said, but um, there we were with the little some porta potties and things like that. That looks like Bert Gummer's house from Tremors. Wait, which franchise is this? Oh no, I'm wrong. Oh, those are the bases of the uh, the drop ships, right? And the top part was added in digitally, um, or they were or they were miniatures. There was a lot of miniature spaceships in the in the movie, and uh, that was a that was a very tactile, cool look. But I like the boxy designs of these things because they look like no nonsense, you know, just form follows function. Make a shoebox full of people and drop it onto a planet. That big crane is uh, was ours. The great all. Um, and we would, we had our great all driver, and there we are. Oh, this must have been when we were repairing it. Yeah, when we, th we thrashed a guy around so much, and Paul kept saying, more, more, more. And I was saying, sir, it's going to break. You're compromising. He said, this is the last time we're going to shoot with this. Uh, use it until it breaks. And we did. But we thought, we better fix it. If we have some downtime, we think it's not going to be used again. But anyway, there's Steve Rosenbluth again, and he is... Uh, Messing around with uh, with fixing it, yeah. Phil Nataro again looking in. Oh, there's the a good shot of the frame, of the base plate, you know, the body plate that the uh, stuntman would go in. Tarps, you got to have everything carved in, covered in tarps because it just pisses rain down in this state, which is, I guess, why it's so eroded there. And there we were fixing, getting it set up, I guess, for the next use. And there I am testing it and realizing that I don't want to be a stuntman. I'd rather stand here with my arms crossed, looking authoritative. 
Uh, look at the Jumanji cap on George Bernardo. Yeah, it was great. Oh, there's uh, Mark Vignello back there. Mark was a uh, jack of all trades and a foam runner and a mold maker, and he basically does everything. There's the team. That's the uh, Yancey Calzada on the end, another member of the mechanical team. That was the puppeteering system. You're going to see in a minute uh, the craziness of... Oops, there's that, that stump, that Kevin Yeager stump. Look at that. They look good even in flash photography. There's the controls, their ergonomic controls. All right, so you'll see what the system was. Uh, uh, it, it, the bug is mounted on the end of a crane, and to make gross body movements, we would swing the crane around. But you get something out on that uh, lever arm, it gets pretty heavy. And uh, you, so you have to get some muscle behind it. But like, So there's hydraulic movement kicking the thing up, the arms are hydraulic, the legs are follow along, but that side to side swaying is created with sheer muscle power um, at the end of the, of the, uh, the crane. And you can see the, the cameraman is now, he's moving around frantically and swinging around. That adds greatly to the um, energy of the shot. Like just sitting back like this, it looks a little boring and slow, but when you look through the lens of that handheld camera, it's suddenly very, very exciting. And uh, those shots really helped texture the, uh, um, the the action. And you can just simply frame out the, the the crane in the background. You're looking up at it. You don't see it. It's you know the the butt the the bug's butt is uh, extending off the back of uh, you know out of frame. And you know it's, it's very convincing. There's the guys, the heroic guys, uh, uh, pushing and pulling on the uh, crane. So these guys were stunt performers, and um, that's why they're in those uniforms, because they were doing double duty as long as, uh, you know, they're helping their stunt buddy out. But that's how it works. And some of our crew was jumped in there. I believe Mark Vignello was doing a lot to... Um, to coordinate these movements. But the, the thing that happens is you get exhausted, right? And you get into this sort of rhythmic back and forth. So you have to like really mix it up and um, really do erratic movements so that it translates into something with energy and uh, lifelike quality. Um, look at the big arc lights too, blasting light in the background and make it look like explosions going off. Those, those uh, cables, Connie Kiyuchi is pulling on a cable mounted to the knees of the bug because that gives us extra control. And in most cases, you never even saw those wires, but you, if you did, they could easily be digitally removed. Look at this. It's hilarious, isn't it? It's like they're rowing a giant uh, galley in uh, ancient Rome or something. Um, yeah, and there's Mark with his giant 90s uh, headset on listening to commands. I don't know if that's me on the other end shouting which way to push it and pull it and stuff. And then these guys had it easy, didn't they? There's George Bernardo and Phil. They were just, Phil Nataro, they'd just watch, you know, yeah, calm, move their little little sticks around, and then the creature would bite and chomp and stuff. Everyone was doing their part. I'm only kidding. So this was uh, kind of our lives for a number of months out on location uh, in Wyoming and uh, South Dakota, as well as back in Los Angeles. And it was uh, a fantastic movie, Starship Troopers, uh, one of the biggest films ever. Um, it was the year that Titanic came out, so I think they beat us in budget, and they also beat us at the Academy Awards. I was nominated, along with Phil Tippett and Scott Anderson, and John Richardson, I believe, the physical effects um, uh, um, guy on that, who was also on Aliens. Uh, we had worked with him on that. Um, and, uh, yeah, we didn't make that, but we sure uh, made a historic film. And for that, we are grateful to Paul Verhoeven and Sony Studios. Alan Marshall was a producer on that. Great guy. Lots of fun. Um, John Davison. Uh, was on it and uh, as a producer and he was a lot of fun just great memories it was a very difficult shoot um, but uh, we knew that uh, what we were doing was going to be uh, a, a, a memorable movie going experience so um, yeah just a lot of fun and I didn't ever do that so I was grateful also um, to not have to push the ass end of a crane around. Anyway, thank you for joining us, Studio ADL, and we'll see you on the next one. This is Alec Gillis signing out.